In this video I'm going to cover some of the actions which the owner can take to minimise the chance of axle failure when he's on a trip. And this includes both preparation for the trip and also what can be done once the trip has started. I'm going to leave the rather more radical subject of axle strengthening to the next video. Now a lot of what I'm going to say will appear to be very obvious to some people and I do apologise for that. However, the points do need to be reiterated because it's surprising how often they get overlooked. There will also be other information uh, which may be unfamiliar to most viewers. Now when preparing your vehicle, you need to pay attention to the possibility of fatigue or fracture. There's no point having a super strong vehicle which will resist anything you throw at it if the Achilles heel is a premature fracture of one of the axles. And the golden rule in all of this is to avoid stress raises and discontinuities. Now, firstly, looking at the attachments, um, well, these clearly need to be strong enough for the applied loads. And if there's any sign of weakness there, they need to be beefed up, reinforced, or maybe replaced with stronger aftermarket items. But even if the attachment is super strong, this may be the cause of the underlying problem. And I point here to the longitudinal gussets on the Jeep Renegade axles, which appear to be the cause of the uh, fast fractures there. And these need to be transitioned in. All of this is incidentally detailed in the DNV fatigue design code, which you can download for free if you're interested. You need to make a smooth transition. Sometimes this can be achieved by cutting away uh, with a torch or with a grinding wheel, or you may need to weld on transition pieces. But either way, get a smooth transition from the attachment into the load-bearing member, and the problem will be removed. And finally, pay attention to the individual welds. Inspect them. If there's any sign of distress in any of the welds, they need to be cut out and re-welded, and the surface needs to be dressed off with a grinding wheel to get a smooth profile. Inspection is one of the most important tools we've got to prevent axle failure. And if you're on an overland trip, you'll have some sort of inspection routine. At the bottom end, uh, just looking at the level of the fluids, but I hope you're also looking under the vehicle on a regular basis. And I am suggesting that if you're doing extended mileage on rutted roads, corrugated tracks, that you should also include inspection of the axles. Now we know where the cracks are going to emanate and they will be adjacent to any welded attachments. I've covered all of this in video 6 in this series, so I won't repeat it. But I would like to emphasise that the larger the crack is, the uh, quicker it's going to grow as exemplified by this curve. And if you find a crack of any significant size, you have to assume the worst. Now once a crack gets any significant depth, it will be pulled apart by these surrounding stresses and it should be visible to the naked eye. Um, but you may have to use a magnifying glass and a torch just to be sure. Now the good news is that the indications are that axles made out of good quality steels at normal temperatures, they're actually very tolerant of fatigue cracks before they finally fail. And they should be able to sustain quite long through thickness cracks. And these will certainly be visible and will probably be accompanied by an oil leak, which is an alarm bell. But the bad news is that um, once a crack gets to this size, the axle is on its last legs. If you find a significant crack, you need to get it attended to as quickly as possible, drive to a workshop as slowly as your patience allows you to, and for heaven's sake avoid hitting potholes or putting other shops into the system, because that could be fatal. And when you get to the workshop, an emergency repair can be done with the axle in situ, but this is unlikely to be satisfactory and probably won't last very long. So you've really got to get the axle off the vehicle, get it onto a workbench, get the damaged area ground out and re-welded. You also need to consider why the crack appeared in the first place and you may have to add local reinforcement. 
Well, nothing I'm going to say now will be news to any viewers out there. It's all been said before, but nonetheless, everything I'm going to say is fully supported by what I found when making videos 5 and 6 in this series. So firstly, speed of travel. Well, it's often said when travelling off-road, you should travel as slowly as possible, but as fast as necessary. And exactly the same applies if you're travelling on dirt roads, corrugations, poorly maintained tarmac roads. You should travel as slowly as your patience allows you to. And if you do feel the need to crack on in order to get home early, bear in mind you have been putting a lot of fatigue damage into the suspension. Other obvious items will obviously use the right tyre pressures and reduce tyre pressures on bad roads, reduces the dynamic loads going into the suspension. You stick to the GVM, the gross vehicle mass. When fitting parts to the suspension, well, all of the critical items need to be of manufacturer's quality or better. Don't be tempted to fit shonky aftermarket parts which are going to fail early. Now I have in mind things like um, the ball housings uh, to the CV joints. And making, when making mods to the vehicle, again stick to the manufacturer recommendations. So for example, heavy duty rear suspensions, manufacturers sell this because they have minimum adverse effects. And the same would go to air helper springs. They're absolutely fine. On the other hand, uh, wheel spacers are a complete no-no and are also banned in many countries. And if you want to fit wider tyres, again, stick within the manufacturer limits. If you want to, to fit super wide tyres on deeply dished rims, you are going to be putting much higher stresses into the axles and it will cause premature failure at some point.